Thank you so much for making time to share your insights into the future of leadership. Mm. But before we go into leadership, can you share a little bit about your own backgrounds? Mm. Where did you grow up? I'm a Jobo girl. Uh, I've, I've spent my whole life here. Um, went to school here, went to university here. Yeah. Have always worked here. And as you grew up, what was your dream career? Uh, well, from the time when I was about 12 years old, I was interested in politics. Right. Um, I think that was really about the time when I sort of became conscious of yeah. um, politics as a, as a career. Right. Um, and I, I come from a family that is quite politically conscious. Yeah. Uh, dinner time was always a time when there were political discussions or current affairs discussions. Uh, it was, uh, you know, my childhood was before technology, so the encyclopedias were all over the dinner table uh, when things were being argued. Right. Um, but also I had parents who were socially aware and socially conscious. Yeah. And from a very early age, um, they made me aware of the inequities of the apartheid system. So, I mean, my, my earliest political memory, I think I was about seven years old. And at that stage, we were living in a flat in Kilani. And we used to go to the Kilani shopping center. And there was a, there was a big piece of white walling. Yeah. And I remember that there were two slogans that were sprayed on that wall. The one was Free Mandela. And then at some other stage, there was a slogan, uh, Remember Sharpa. Right. And I can remember very clearly asking my mother, what, what does this mean and why yeah. is this spread on the wall? And she explained to me who Nelson Mandela was, the fact he was in prison, the Sharpa massacre and so on. And I mean, that I was... A young child then, seven or eight years mm -hmm. old. So uh, that's the kind of environment in which I grew up. And I suppose it had a very big impact on my outlook. Right. My first year at Wits University was 1976. Okay. And I was doing um, political science, mm -hmm. uh, was, was one of my major subjects. And we had a, a, his, um, a political science lecturer who, he was an American, and I suppose his own youth had been spent in the 1960s in the, the student struggles um, yeah. against the Vietnam War in, in the States. And he, on, on June the 16th, I remember being in the canteen and hearing over the radio in the canteen that... Um, something had happened in Soweto. It wasn't very clear what. And then we went at two o'clock to his political science lecture. And he said to us, uh, today we are not having a lecture. Mm -hmm. Two students were killed in Soweto this morning. He explained to us what the protests were about. And he said, we're going to go and demonstrate on Jans Matz Avenue. Right. And we went out there. And uh, the rest, as they say, is history. So, where did you start your career? Uh, well, I suppose you would not have called it a career. Um, and certainly, uh, uh, friends and family didn't think uh, much of my choices. But um, I became active in student politics. Uh, I joined the ANC underground structures in 1979. Right. Uh, I then became active in um, the the emergent structures of the Congress movement in the early 80s that mm -hmm. ultimately culminated in the formation of the United Democratic Front. I spent four years ducking and diving after the, the state of emergency, the two states of emergency in 1985 and 86. Mm -hmm. I left the country in... Uh, 87, 88. I went for military training in the Soviet Union. Right. 
came back here um, I think it was early 1989 yeah. mm -hmm. and then uh, subsequently there was the FW de Klerk announcement mm -hmm. in the Iron the ANC um, and I was elected to the Gauteng Provincial Legislature in 1994. Yeah. Um, so I suppose that was the first time I earned a salary for being a politician. Right. <laughs> Before that, I was I worked for various NGOs and yeah. uh, I worked for the United Democratic Front. Had a civic desk. Uh, we earned what today we'd call a stipend. Right. Um, yeah. And can you tell us who were your sources of inspiration during that period? Well, I think it was the the leadership of the ANC, obviously mm -hmm. um, Nelson Mandela and the Rabani trialists who were on mm -hmm. Robben Island. There would have been the exiled leadership of, of the ANC, Oliver Tambo, mm -hmm. um, Joe Slovo, Ruth First. Um, but uh, there was obviously uh, an internal leadership of the, the United Democratic Front. Many of those were people who had themselves been uh, served uh, prison sentences on Robben Island and been released, people like Kalema Motlante. Yeah. So uh, I would say that, that, that by and large they were um, the people that, that influenced me and the, the people whose whose words and, and uh, views that, that I, I followed. Um, the other thing that had a very big impact on my political development was the, was the Vietnam War. Um, as I told you, my parents were very politically aware and um, the magazine that always was at home, not that it's necessarily a, a, a source of left-wing inspiration, was uh, Time magazine, and um, mm -hmm. there was a, a lot of information about the Vietnam War, and I can remember reading this as you know, about nine, ten, eleven years old. Mm -hmm. um, and subsequently, I came to to read um, work. You know, uh, uh, there, there was a book that we all read at that time by someone called Le Duan. Uh, called Grasshoppers and Elephants. It was mm -hmm. about the tactics, the, the underground tactics um, of the Vietnamese Communist Party in, in the, the occupied South. Yeah. Um, Ho Chi Minh himself, I mean, one of the pilgrimages of my life was to go to Vietnam and to go to the Ho Chi Minh Trail. Um, because that, that war and the, the struggle against uh, American colonialism and, and imperialism had a very, very profound effect on me. So did you go on the Yes, yes, yes. Okay. And I, I did it. Yeah. Um, I took my children there and, uh, you know, they, they always say to me, because they were very young at the time, they always say to me, we, we never understood. We, we liked going yeah. to Vietnam, but we never understood why you took us there. Yeah. Um, and, you know, we, we visited the, the, the battlegrounds of the demilitarized yeah. zone and the terrible graveyards that lit in those hills and the famous road where uh, that little girl who was yeah. napalmed had, yeah. had run along uh, and, and also the um, uh, the Vinmok tunnels yeah. where, where people had lived under, literally underground yeah. in the demilitarized zone so yes so well, that had a very profound effect on, on so looking back over your career, what would you say was a major turning point? Well, I suppose as a young person, um, it would have been the 1976 yeah. uprising, which, which would have been when I became actively involved myself. Yeah. Um, obviously, 1994 in the democratic transition was a very huge yeah. turning point for all of us because up until that point, I suppose we had thought we, we might spend the rest of our lives on the run. Mm. Um, and um, I suppose just for me personally, in terms of my career, um, 
I was appointed a member of the Executive Council in 2004. Mm-hmm. And, you know, up until that time, I had, I had had all kinds of responsibilities and played all kinds of roles, but it was not uh, as, as the front person in mm-hmm. the public eye. It was always as, as part of the, of, mm-hmm. of the backroom group of people. Right. And um, the the week the, the the in the week before I was appointed, uh, so my first week of my appointment, Brenda Farsi died. Yeah. Uh, South Africa was awarded the the World Cup mm-hmm. in that first week. Right. And my very first political engagement was. Uh, I was called by, by somebody that I knew and I was told, look, um, you have to go to, uh, I can't remember now whether it was Small Park or the Cambridge, but one, one hospital, you have to go there. Mm-hmm. And Brenda Farsi is in a, mm-hmm. is in a coma mm-hmm. and you, you have to go there and you have to meet the family and so on. So off I went. And when I came out, the world's media were there. Mm-hmm. Um, every television camera, every mm-hmm. radio, every journalist on the planet. Mm-hmm. I had never participated in a press conference in my life. Mm-hmm. And I walked out into this media store. And everybody says, and w- when I had, I had seen Brenda, it was very clear to me that she was Mm-hmm. no longer with us, mm-hmm. but she was on life support. But the family had not come to terms with it, mm-hmm. so they didn't want an announcement. Mm-hmm. And I walk out into the storm completely unprepared, and everybody says, How is Brenda? Mm-hmm. Is she going to recover? Mm-hmm. I stand there and I think, Please, oh, God, help me. What? What do I say? Mm. And I took a very deep breath and I said, we are asking the nation to pray Mm. for Brenda. And within two seconds, this was playing on, I mean, it was before the days of social media, but Mm. it was playing on every television channel, every radio station. Mm. The MEC for Arts and Culture says the nation must pray for Brenda. Mm. And about two hours later, Tabo Mbeke, who was still president, went there. Mm. And uh, he obviously thought it was a good line because he came out and he said the same thing. So that was my, that was where I started. And at the, so that was Monday. And on Saturday we won the World Cup. And I was the only person in the sports sector in a mm-hmm. leadership position who was in the country. Everybody else was in Geneva. Mm-hmm. So we're down at Mary Fitzgerald Square. And uh the head of one of the Johannesburg tourism agencies mm. comes to me and she says to me, um, well, you already know that we've won the World Cup and we're mm. all here at the celebration mm. and you are the only person responsible for this portfolio in the country. Mm. Everybody else is in Geneva. Mm. So, we, so there's live feed mm. to the whole world of all these ministers and everybody being interviewed in Geneva. And very soon we will be crossing to Barbara Tracy in South Africa. <laughs> that was my second press conference was being live all over the world. How happy we are that we've got the World Cup and da 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 da. So um, that was a very big, uh, it was a very big turning point for me because I had to come out from being in the shadows, I had to mm. learn to to be in a public place, I had mm. to learn to be coherent. And, you know, sports, arts and culture may not be the most senior portfolio in the executive, mm. but it's a very high profile job mm. um, because you are at all of these events where all these celebrities are. And in fact, most ordinary people watch sports, arts and culture, they don't watch the news. Mm. So um, I really had to learn there. Um, from from having no no experience whatsoever, mm. and I had to learn in an area, in an area where 
I really didn't have any knowledge whatsoever. I mean, I was the kind of child who banked sport if she possibly could at school. Um, I, I was not interested mm. in, in, in sport. Uh, I knew nothing about arts and culture. I was a, I was a very sort of uh, bookish, academic kind of person. And I was forced into this role where I just had to live. And uh, I suppose later on you ask what are the important things about being a leader, and one of them is that you have to learn. Mm. Uh, you get given opportunities, mm. and uh, I have a friend who likes to say that the opportunity of a lifetime must be taken in the lifetime of the opportunity. Mm. And uh, this was my opportunity to mm. to go into a different realm. It wasn't the job I would have chosen, mm. um, but that's what I was given and that's what I had to learn to do. Um, and I believe that was around the 15th of May, 2004. That is, yeah, that's when it would have been. Mm. Uh, I don't remember the date, I just remember, <laughs> I just remember that week was like, mm. uh, just being on a roller coaster. And let me see, can you tell us what is driving you today? Look, I think what drives me is is what has always driven me, and that is that I am I'm very passionate about social justice and equality in this country. I'm very passionate about the role that I think that government and the organisation that I've always belonged to, the African National Congress, should play in this. Um, I know that for many people we have deviated and and for ourselves as well we have deviated from that path um, I think this is a very important moment in history for our country um, and I'm very glad that I have the opportunity to to play a role in that and I want to play a role in it because I think that that we have to return our organization to the values that it has espoused historically and we have to make sure that government meets well, government does what it's there for, and that is to meet the needs of the millions of people in this country that are completely dependent on government services for their well-being. Now, let us talk about leadership. Um, can you tell us, and I know it's a big question, but can you tell us what does the future of leadership mean to you? Well, I suppose that leadership has, has always involved issues around winning support from people, inspiring people, trying to pre present people with a, with a vision. Um, but I, I think that in the modern world, that is a that is a much more complicated task mm -hmm. than even one faced, say, 20 years ago mm -hmm. in, in our own context and our own environment. Mm -hmm. And really the reason for that is that advances in technology have meant that ordinary people have got a lot more information than they've ever had, but ordinary people are themselves newsmakers. Mm -hmm. and um what that means is that they are much more skeptical of so-called official leaders mm -hmm. or the, those who, who are supposed to be playing that role mm -hmm. in society. They're much more skeptical. They have much more information on which to, to mm -hmm. criticize. But also, um, I think that I think information and and the, the 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 digital age can be very empowering because it can give people access to knowledge and information. But I think we've also seen lots of examples in the modern world where it can be it can be very negative. So uh, it's not just good views that can be shared with everybody; it's bad views as well. And and I think that one has seen in the United States, how backward reactionary views um, 
things which 10 years ago people would have considered completely unacceptable to say in the public domain, things that are racist, sexist, mm. um, prejudicial against various mm. categories of people in society, um, also mm. have, an equal, have an equal airing. And uh, I think that we know that if people want, want access to negative information and dangerous information, mm. that is also available. You know, I, I used to be the MEC of education mm. and and we had problems with Satanism in schools. Mm. And and part of the reason why this cult could cr grow and flourish was mm. because these kids were accessing information about Satanism sure. online, which um, when I was growing up, uh, you might have heard that people were Satanists, mm. but you had no idea what it was, and you you had no access to any information that mm. could enlighten you should you be interested. So it's uh, so what it means is that is that leaders are working in a in a very contested space, mm. um, and therefore you you i think as a leader it it really it really means that that there is a constant challenge mm. to you um to to argue your point to get mm. your message across and it's not something that you can do anymore by having a press conference once a week or once a month mm. uh, it, it requires a lot of active mm. and ongoing engagement and that i think that that shapes the role. Mm. Um, and it's, uh, it's, it's something, I'll, I'll be honest with you, I battle with that. I'm a, mm. you know, I'm, I'm very happy to sort of do my work and to do mm. my work 24 seven. But, but the level on which um, one is required to share information Mm. About even myself, I mm. find very difficult. I'm a, on a personal level, I'm just a very pr private person, and I find that very difficult. And I can see that other people are more successful if they mm. share more about themselves, but I can't. Mm. Uh, now, can you tell us what have you learned from your own journey that you consider most important for building future leaders? Look, I, I, I think I think this issue that. Leaders are not born, mm. they're created. Mm. Um, and obviously, they're created by a combination of circumstance and opportunity. Mm. But I think that, that there's also a lot about working on oneself. Mm. Um, if, if, you, if you want uh, to be in a political leadership role, and I work with lots of people who aspire to mm. be in these roles. Mm. Uh, I always say to them, um, it comes at a price. Mm. And, and you have to understand the price. So first of all, um, if, if you're going to have any credibility, you're going to have to give up a lot of your own time and space and energy mm and put it into into service. Mm. But the other price that it comes is is that you're going to have to constantly work on yourself to say, don't be defensive, uh, let me try and understand what this criticism is about and see whether I can take it in and learn mm. and grow from it. And so, so I think that the, the issue of self-cultivation is, is very important. Mm. The other thing that's very important is creativity. Mm. Um, I mean, you, I read your book um, on King Shaka, mm. and, and I absolutely agree with the point you're making there that, that creativity and, and, and you call it innovation is, is very important. And what that means is that you being finding creativity and what I mean by creativity is as a as a person in a leadership role you will you will find more problems than you have answers to. 
And first of all, as time goes on, your problem solving ability increases. Mm. And if you make correct decisions, your confidence in making decisions mm. increases. And so you can make many more decisions in a day and not, mm. not have to ponder over them too much. Mm. But there will always be those issues that come that require lateral thinking. And you can't deal with those issues if you are under siege. Mm. So in a way, you also have to, in a very busy life and a very full life, you've got to carve out space for yourself mm. Not because you're trying to catch a suntan or something, but because if you don't have a bit of personal space, you can't think. Mm. And I mean, the most interesting decisions I've ever made and the most, I think some of the most successful decisions I've ever made have mm. been after I've had a, I've made the decision after a mm. holiday. Mm. Um, and, and I've had the chance to do nothing and suddenly it comes to me, mm. that's how you deal with this. There's a, you know, you, you, you have to say to yourself, stand the problem on its head and say, mm. okay, there's not either this or that. There's mm. another option, mm. but you just can't see it. So put it on, a, on its side and mm. try and find yourself some space, go for a walk, mm. stare at the trees. Mm. It will come to you. Now, MEC, when you speak to aspiring leaders, what do you tell them they should focus on for future proofing their career if that is possible? Look, I think that that one of the things I used to say when I was MEC for education is that the reason why schooling is important is because it opens up doors for you later. And a tertiary education, uh, it's statistically proven that people with tertiary education have a better chance of employment, mm. but they also have a better chance of earning more money. Mm. And I think that's why we try to put so much effort into making sure that working class children can access tertiary education because mm. it's, it's, it's a great equalizer mm. uh, in society. But education is also the one thing that nobody can take away from you. Mm. You can lose all your material possessions, mm. but as long as you are alive and in reasonable mm. health, what the, the, the work that you've done on your mind and your knowledge <coughs> is something that no one can take away from you. And obviously, the more you, the more formal education you have, the greater possibility that you will be able to think about problems that you haven't encountered before mm. in a different way. So I think that's that's very important. Um, obviously, in the modern world, uh, digital literacy is, you know, when, when I grabbed my mother said, there's two important things you have to have. You must be able to type and you must be able to drive. Mm. Well, now I would say you must be you must be digitally literate. Mm -hmm. And fortunately, most two year olds are digitally literate. <laughs> but but that's that's very important. Um, and keeping up, mm -hmm. uh, which of course is less of a problem for young people. It's more mm -hmm. of a problem for people of my age, realizing that you that you have to keep up because otherwise you can be marginalized from from your own life. Uh, I think that's very important. Now, MEC, you touched on technology <laughs> and you recently gave the keynote to the Future of Technology Conference. Um, what would you say are the technologies or maybe the tools of technology that are important for the future of leadership? the tools of technology? Well, I suppose um, there, are, there are two very important uh, issues that are, yeah. are starting to come onto the agenda. And the first one is the issue of big data. Um, now, I think that um, 
in, in the school of leadership where I come from, we, we like to say that our decisions are evidence-based. Mm. Now, the, the advent of big data offers the possibility that leadership decisions can be evidence-based as mm. never before. And I think linked to that is because uh, the existence of data is one thing. And mm. I mean, government has got any amount of data. The issue is how do you access that data mm. and what do you access? And that's where I think the, the other important tool is coming in, and that is the issue of artificial intelligence. Mm. So how, because we, we are now collecting so much data that um, as human beings, we would never have the capacity or the time to process it all. Um, and that's where I think artificial intelligence starts to become very important because what we've got to start to work on is, so if we want to make certain decisions, what data do we need? And how how is that data processed and made accessible in the shortest possible amount of time? And when it comes to social media, what do you tell future leaders and maybe even your children? How should they go about using social media to communicate? Well, I suppose the, that your, your guideline for social media has to be the same as the guideline you would have in your, your normal inter mm. the everyday interaction. So, if you don't want your mother to see it, mm. don't put it on social media. Okay. So, you know, I think you just have to have a rule of thumb. How would my mother feel if she mm. saw this? And if the answer is not very good, don't put it on social media. Because mm. once it's there, it's going to be there forever. Um, and, I mean, I... I <laughs> look, it, it does astound me what kids put on social mm. media. Um, you know, I do not understand that we serve breakfast and then the next thing my son's taking photos mm. and it's going on Facebook. Look what my mother gave me for breakfast. Mm. I don't I don't understand that and I don't mm. understand the need to do it. But but the point about that is that kids also put a lot of other very inappropriate mm. stuff on social media. And I think that we live we still live in a very conservative world. So we may have access to all this knowledge and information and we may know things as young people today which our parents and grandparents didn't even know about. But it doesn't mean that it's any more socially acceptable than it was uh, in those days. So I, I always say to my kids, just err on the side of caution as to what you, you put here because you don't want in the future when you apply for a job and somebody Googles you, mm. the stuff comes up. And you've got to think about mm. it. Um, Now, MUC, you've been a mentor to many aspiring leaders. Can you maybe share a success story with us where you mentored somebody and that person took your advice to heart? Well, I have a lovely story um, that, that still brings me joy on an ongoing mm. basis. It's again when I was uh, MC for sport. And uh, I go one day to see a community sports event in Mamelodi. And it's a little community sports event. Mm -hmm. And it's during the school holidays and it's these community football teams playing games with each other and then mobilizing kids from the community to come and watch mm -hmm. and come and learn football and so on. Mm -hmm. Nice little event. So for some reason or other I go to that event. And while I'm there I meet a young man whose name is Life Sichlangu. And, and he comes to me and he says, he starts talking to me and he asks me what do I think about the tournament and he tells me he's the organizer of this tournament and so on and so on. And we have this long chat. When I'm going, he says to me, let me see, I have ambitions in my life. And I say, what, what are your ambitions? And he says, I want to get a degree in sports science and 
I want to work in the Department of Sport and I want to run these programs all over the province. Mm -hmm. And and Anthony tells me his views about the role of sport in social cohesion and working with young people and stopping substance abuse and so on. So I'm doing conversation here. And, uh, and he says to me, so I don't want to stay here on mm. the side of this foot field in the for the rest mm. of my life. Anyway, eventually we say goodbye to each other. And the following day, the Minister of Sports phones me and he says to me, listen, Barbara, on Friday, and now it's Tuesday, uh, the South African government is sending the latest contingent of young people to study sports science in Cuba. And two people have just dropped out mm. from this. So I'm phoning you to ask you if you have anybody who you would want to put on this program. And you must understand that um, if they if they're going to go, they're going on Friday, mm. and that's it. Mm. So I said, okay, Minister, I definitely want one of those places. Mm. I don't know about the other one. So I had Life's phone number, so I phoned Life, and I said, Life, mm. um, where are you? No, I'm still in Memelody, still at the sports field. I said, okay, I'm sending somebody up there to fetch you. Mm. I want to see you now. So I send my drivers up there to fetch him and he comes and he comes into my office and I say to him, okay, so if you want to study sports science, you can go to Cuba on Friday. He says, what? I say, if you want to study sports mm. science, you can go to Cuba on Friday. Mm. He says, on Friday? So I say, yes. So he says, on Friday? Yes. Takes a very deep breath. He says, okay. So I said, right, now, have you got a passport? No, it doesn't have a mm. passport. Have you got a suitcase? No, it doesn't have a suitcase. So I said, okay, now, uh, you go home and you tell your manner that you, this is what you're going to do and you, you get her permission and this is my phone number if she wants to talk to anybody. She can call me and I will explain to her. And while you're there, get your birth certificate mm. and your ID book. Um, and we take you to home affairs. And then I went to the water bank and I drew out mm. 2,000 rand. I said, right, buy this man a mm. suitcase. Um, it's not very cold in Cuba, but buy him a raincoat. I said, do you have a raincoat? No, he doesn't have a raincoat. So you're going to mm. need a raincoat in Cuba. Couldn't think of anything else you would need in Cuba. Maybe a swimming costume. So, Friday, life goes to Cuba. And every year, we used to, we used to bring these students back. Mm. And every year, he would come and see me. And it was really tough. Mm. Because, first of all, they have to learn Spanish. Because, so the first year, all they do is learn Spanish. Mm. And these are youngsters, and they're in a foreign country, and mm. they don't know anybody. And... They're living in a hostel and life mm. is hard and they don't have any money and 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 and, mm. and and every year he would come home and he would tell me all his problems and we would sit and talk about them and in the end he became a significant organizer of all the students mm. in Cuba and I mean there have been a lot of ups and downs with those students because people go all excited and then mm. it's, it's really hard and they don't enjoy it. And eventually he graduated and he came back here. By then I was, I'd left sport, I was in education, but we got him an internship in sport. He subsequently, um, I think now he's an assistant director or deputy director, mm. but he always, he, he always keeps in touch. And now I've bought a house, mm. now I've bought a car. And it's just, I mean, to me, every day, you know, he every couple of months he'll send me a little message and I always just get a big smile on my face mm. when this happens because it's such a story mm. about a person who who was prepared to seize what was given to mm. him and to to live his dream. 
Um, so for me, it's that's that's just a wonderful story. Now, can you tell us who are the role models of leadership that you feel future leaders should maybe study and learn from? You know, I think uh, a big issue for millennials, and um, I mean, I have I have three of my own millennials. Mm -hmm. Is millennials are the now generation? Mm -hmm. They want everything now. And I remember a few years back having this conversation with my daughter, who decided that she's she's giving up on life, she's just giving up. So we sit down, let's have this conversation. Why are we giving up? No, because I'll never achieve what you've achieved. I'll, ne I'll never achieve what you, you've achieved. And I'll never, I'll never be able to do these things and I'll never do, and then I'll never make the contribution that you've made and I'll never this and I'll never that and I don't have the purpose. Ooh. You know, when I was 20, I was a disaster. Um, I was a crazy insecure kid. Mm -hmm. uh, you much more, uh, you you much, you much more secure. You much more thought through. You much more than I was at that mm -hmm. age. And what you're doing is you look you're looking at a at a thirty forty year project, mm -hmm. uh, and you're on this side of the project, and you're mm -hmm. saying I'm never going to get there. How do you know you're not going to get there? How do you not know that you're not going to get somewhere else? Mm -hmm. And the reason I'm telling you this story is that I think that because of all the issues of access to knowledge and information mm. that millennials have, they they want everything now, mm. the way that the digital age is. Mm. And the, the concept that you've got to do the journey, mm. that there aren't actually any shortcuts. I think that that is the most difficult thing to share with young people because how do you give, it, it, it's hard to give people perspective mm. that this is, it's a journey. And somebody said to me when I was young, staying in mm. and doing the distance is more important than being the instant mm. bright star. Mm. Um, and I've often thought about that in the course of my life, mm. especially when things have been tough and when I've wanted to give up. Mm. I've, I've said to myself, staying in and doing the distance. Um, so that that issue of fortitude uh, is is very important. And I think I think that you know creativity inspiration those are things that that millennials are good at but fortitude mm. i think is is going to be a tough thing for for millennials and it's a very it's how do you say that to somebody mm. uh you know i haven't done all this time out of choice it just happened mm. <laughs> um so that that i think is a is a is a difficult thing well, and you see, um, how can our listeners follow you and how can they connect with you? Um, I'm on Twitter mm. at Barbara Creasy, uh, also at Gauteng Treasury, um, at eGov. Mm -hmm. those, are, those are my two departments, Instagram. Um, I'm not terribly good at Facebook, I must mm. be honest. Um, I'm better at old fashioned email. Mm. Barbara Creasy at gauteng.gov.za. Mm. And tell us, last but not least, is there one piece of advice that you would really like to convey to future leaders that are considering entering public service? We really need you. Mm. Uh, our country needs you. Mm. Um, I think that the that public service is something that perhaps has gone out of fashion. Mm. But uh, our country needs bright, ambitious, clever young people because we have huge challenges. Mm. Um, 
And if we don't have the very best of mm. young people who prepare to take on those challenges, mm. we're not going to solve them. Mm. And um, people like me would like to retire, so can you take them? Mm. Well, let me see. Thank you so much for sharing your insights and your wisdom and, and your empathy. And thank you for he helping us build a better future.